Welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome back, Walter. Oh, welcome back to you too. <laughs> so how have you been this past week? Um, would you like a long list of ailments or shall we just carry on with the program? Let's carry on with the program. I think we'll just carry on with the program. <laughs> <laughs> I'll open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together again. We ask again that you bless the discussion and that you also open our minds with the working of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been working from the last episode. We want to get to persecution. Climax. Yes. What's the issue? What's, what's, what's on the horizon? And today we're going to talk again about the Sabbath. People must be sick and tired of the Sabbath, right? Yeah. That's the first question. Why again with the Sabbath? What are you going on about it the whole time? Well, it seems to be like a trademark, right? So why is it important? Are we going to talk about uh, the details of the Sabbath? No, we've done that before. We're going to talk about the role of the Sabbath in the end times. Yes. That's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yes, that's and it's because it plays a very prominent role. Absolutely, in the you time. can't get rid of it. You can't get rid of it. So, yeah, we have to talk about it again, and then we're also going to see what some other people are saying about the Sabbath. That's the interesting bit. Yeah. So, Sabbath or not is one of the questions, and the other one is. Children of Israel or children of God? Where do you get that from? Well, I've heard some people say that the Old Testament talks about the children of Israel. But we're not the children of Israel anymore. Okay. We're now the children of God. Mm -hmm. So they actually put it, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now what about Adam, who was son of God? If you read the genealogy... And it says, begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, Adam, son of God. So originally, when Adam was created, he was the son of God. And uh, then they started talking about the children of Israel. Now, who was Israel? It was Jacob, right? Yes. And when did Jacob become Israel? After he's wrestling with the Lord. After he wrestles with the Lord. What was he wrestling about? To be blessed. Ah, uh -huh. He wanted to be blessed and he would not let go because his sins overwhelmed him. Mm. And he would not let go until the Lord blessed him. And so his name was changed to Israel. And thereafter, the descendants of Jacob were called the children of Israel. So basically, Israel means wrestled with God, right? And overcame. So everybody who wrestles with God and overcomes, in other words, finds forgiveness in Christ and is covered by Christ's righteousness, becomes the Israel of God. Mm. Now, in today's world, you have a little literal Israel, which is an interesting name. Mm -hmm. In the past, you had the northern tribes, which were called Israel, and the other ones were called Judah. Judah. But they were all the children of Israel. Yes. So... There were both houses were the children of Israel. So we have to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. And are the children of Israel not the children of God? Or are they implicitly the children of God? Yeah, or is there separation? Is there a difference? Was exactly. So let's look at some of these issues. Does Christ have two wives? Well, yeah. that's what dispensationalism basically teaches. He has two brides. So you have a literal Israel. And you have a, a church. Isaiah 2, 19, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yeah, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. And Second Corinthians, we jump to the New Testament. It says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the one is talking about the children of Israel yeah. and the other one is talking to the church. Mm. And they both have the same husband. Where do you get your righteousness from? From Christ. Are you sure? Yes. Is there any other place where you can get it? No. No. 
That's the only place that you can get it, right? Uh, who who has who is the 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 one over all judgment? Also, Christ. oh, it's Christ. So where do we find mercy? Also in, in Christ. Christ. So the the God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament, one and the same. We're talking about Jesus Christ, and the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. Yes. In Acts 13, verse 32, we read, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, who's he talking about? The Israelites. The ch children of Israel. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So the promises for Israel apply to whom? To everyone. Yeah, everyone to the, the church as well, right? Galatians 3.29 And if ye be Christ's, then ye be Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. That's interesting. That's putting it. So Abraham's seed, that's the children of Israel, right? <laughs> And he's talking here to the New Testament people or the Old Testament? New Testament. So if you be Christ's, then you be Abraham's seed. Yeah, not the other way around. Aha. Uh -huh. So when it talks about Abraham's seed, it's singular. Mm. That's Christ. Paul makes that very clear in, in the New Testament, right? So if you are in Christ, then you are the seed of Abraham. Because only in Christ do you find salvation. So we're not talking about a literal seed. Well, we are talking yeah. about a literal seed, that seed being Christ. Right. But in terms of who the promises apply to, everyone who is in Christ, everyone who followed the cloud, everybody who looked at the pole with the serpent, the symbol of Christ, who became sin for us by faith shall be saved. So it's about Christ. To separate them is a misnomer. You shall not separate what Christ has brought together. Can I ask, what about now the different covenants? Is there different covenants? Is there some that were made only with Israel and then others with the New Testament people? Well, what is the new covenant? The new covenant is that the law is written in your hearts. So the law is not done away with? Absolutely not. So it was written on stone, and hopefully they had it in their heart. But the new covenant is with those who have it in their heart. It applies to those who are in Christ, in other words. That's all it says. Mm -hmm. So the Old Testament is the gospel in type. The New Testament is the gospel in verity. It's the same gospel. Now Galatians chapter 4 verse 28 says, Now we brethren as Isaac was are the children of promise. Who is he speaking to? The, the, church? the, the church, yes. He's speaking to the church. So the church are the children of promise. Mm. So if you reject Christ, are you then still the seed of, of Abraham? No. No, because, because only when you are in Christ yes. are you the seed of Abraham. Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. What is this new creature? One who has accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. One who has wrestled with Christ and found forgiveness through repentance, mercy, righteousness in Christ. And there wasn't a difference for the old testament israelites as well they also the circumcision didn't bring you to christ no. you had to be that was just a sign you had to have it was an outside symbol of an inner conviction yeah. galatians 6 16 and as many as walk according to this rule peace be on them and mercy upon the israel of god so who's the israel of god those who are in christ yes now let's go back in history 
and see what Eusebius's view was. Now he was this historian, remember, yeah, yeah. famous historian. And he wrote, then the spiritual seed of Abraham fled to Pella. Mm. So tell me, who fled to Pella? Was it the Christians or was it the Jews? The Christians. Ah, uh -huh. so the spiritual seed of Abraham, let's say the mm. Christians, fled to Pella on the other side of the Jordan. Yeah, this was with the destruction of the Jerusalem. Correct. What did they do there? Where they found a safe place of refuge and could serve their master and, excuse me, what was that? Keep the Sabbath. So who kept the Sabbath? The Christians had fled from Jerusalem. That's according to Eusebius. Now, dispensationalists like to separate them into these two groups, the church and literal Israel, and there are two dispensations for each one of them. And then they still have the confusion that the one will be raptured and the other will reign with Christ a thousand years down here while the poor thousand-year-old widow waits up there. Now, where does that doctrine come from? Is it in the Bible? No. No. So it comes out of the pen of the Jesuits, right? Correct. It is incomprehensible to me that Protestants should follow the dictates of Jesuitical teaching. But that's a fact. That's yeah. how it works. So now, here's a quote from Patriarchs and Prophets. In Eden, God set up the memorial of his work of creation in placing his blessing upon the seventh day. There's no doubt about that. And God blessed the Sabbath day, it says in Genesis chapter 2. Yes. The Sabbath was committed to Adam, the father and representative of the whole human family. So we start off with the Sabbath. Correct. Okay, let me ask you two trick questions here. They're not trick questions. They're straightforward. Are the Ten Commandments mentioned in Genesis chapter 1? No. Uh, is the Sabbath men mentioned in Genesis chapter 2? Yes. At the culmination of Genesis chapter 1, right? Right at the beginning of chapter 2. Yes. So the Sabbath was prominent from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We assume that obedience was part of the deal because they had to make a choice between good and evil. Mm. And what is evil? What is iniquity? Iniquity is transgression of the law. Yes. Okay, so Adam must have verbally received instructions from God and the Sabbath is pertinently mentioned. Correct. So he's the father and the representative of the whole human family. So the whole human family got the Sabbath. Was there a Jew then? No. Was there, were there children of Israel? No. No, because Jacob hadn't lived yet, right? He was still, as it were, corporately in Adam. Correct. He wasn't there yet. So its observance was to be an act of grateful acknowledgement on the part of all who should dwell upon the earth that God was their creator and their rightful sovereign. So it was a sign from the beginning. Yes. That they were the work of his hands and the subjects of his authority. I mean, you can't put it better than this. This is spot on. Thus the institution was holy, commemorative, and given to all mankind. There was nothing in it shadowy or of restricted application to any people. There was no sin yet. Yes. It was nothing. a permanent institution mm -hmm. given to humanity. The Sabbath was made for man and given to humanity. God designs that the Sabbath shall direct the minds of men to the contemplation of his created works. Nature speaks to their senses, declaring that there is a living God, the creator, the supreme ruler of all. And then there's a quote from Psalms, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. The beauty that clothes the earth is a token of God's love. We may behold it in the everlasting hills and the lofty trees and the opening buds and the delicate flowers. All speak to us of God. The Sabbath ever pointed to him who made them all. 
bids men open the great book of nature and trace therein the wisdom, the power, and the love of the Creator. There's nobody who doesn't love nature. Even the Pope loves nature, it seems. He has an whole encyclical on it. But who is the God of nature? Yes. Do we worship the things or do we worship the God of the things? That is the question. The Sabbath was instituted in the previous episode. You mentioned the or original will of God and the permissive will. With his original will, the Sabbath was instituted. It was there already, yes. So now let's ask the question, why do Christian denominations today not recognize the Sabbath? Mm. Now, we've done many lectures in the past on the Sabbath. It's not our aim to discuss the Sabbath in those details. You can put links in. Yes, I put links of the lectures and sermons that's been done on the Sabbath. And then people can compare it for themselves yes. to what is yeah. being said by other denominations. Now, humanity is basically in rebellion, right? And the Sabbath is a very pivotal part of all of this. Now, here's a quote from various, well, let's go to various Protestant ministries today to find out why they don't keep the Sabbath. Yes, and we are working towards a goal here. Yes, so absolutely. So let's look at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. This is his web page, and he asks the question here, why do Christians worship on Sunday instead of on the Sabbath? A Sabbath means rest. The first reference we find in the Bible about taking a Sabbath rest is God's command in Exodus 16, 23, 26. Well, it's not quite right. The first reference we find to rest is God rested on the Sabbath day, and that was Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, right? But let's leave it at that. But anyway, Exodus chapter 16 is not where the law was given. That was before. Yeah. The law was given in, Genesis, in Exodus chapter 20. He told them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow will be a day of complete rest, the holy Sabbath day set apart for the Lord. Observance of the Sabbath day was a part of the law given exclusively to Israel. Is that true? No. We'll find out. It was included in their covenant with God, which provided their redemption. Under the law, the people of Israel were commanded not to do work of any kind on the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Well, at least he knows that. Mm -hmm but to take a physical rest and to worship God, Exodus 28 to 11, that's the Sabbath commandment. This day served as a reminder that God created the earth in six days and rested on the seventh, that he delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt, and he's quoting Deuteronomy and Genesis, and that his promised Messiah would bring the true rest of redemption. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So he's got some things right there and some things not quite right. Some question whether having church services on Sunday violates God's law. They wonder where the tradition of Sunday church services originated. Well, he's got that right. It's a tradition. tradition. From Scripture we learn that there was not a law for what day believers were to worship. Galatians 4, 9 to 11. Colossians 2, 16. This is fascinating. We'll have to look at that. Eh? Yep. We know the disciples frequently met on Sunday. Acts 20, mm. 7. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Revelation 1, 10. The Lord's Day. That is fascinating. Does it say the Lord's Day is Sunday in Revelation? No. No, it doesn't say that. In fact, if you go through your entire Bible, there's only one definition of what is the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. And that is in Isaiah chapter 58. You shall keep the Sabbath and the Lord's day honorable. Yeah. So this is what we call Babylonian confusion. 
it comes from the mind of an apostate church. Some have suggested it is possible believers began meeting on Sunday in honor of the Lord's resurrection. Others point to it later becoming official when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine. But no new command dictated that day. He's got that right. Yep. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, why are they keeping Sunday? He says there's no commandment. So it's a tradition. And, well, the early church sometimes were together on a Sunday. And we'll look at those texts as well as we carry on. The important thing to remember is that Jesus came to redeem us from the law of sin and death so we could have true spiritual rest and fellowship with God. Not just one day a week, but every day. Not through what we do, but through what he did on the cross to provide for our right standing with God. And then he quotes Romans and Ephesians. As Christians, we can gather together at any day, time or place, and Jesus said he would be right there with us. Now that's perfectly true. Mm -hmm. Does that negate the Sabbath day? No. No. So in other words, what he is saying, we meet on Sunday, but it doesn't matter, we could meet on any day. Correct. But Sunday seems to be very important to them. Mm. So basically they've made a new law, which is not in the Bible. No new command dictated that day. Mm. So that's one view. Now here's another view. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. This is Rick Warren. And we would like to know what his view on the Sabbath is, right? Correct. So let's listen to what he has to say and then we'll talk about it. Why are we doing this? To show the people what the denominations out there are actually saying. Are actually saying. And then what's coming in the future. Uh -huh. Why is it important? Yes. And Why what are the denominations saying? And are they all on the same page in this issue? Exactly. Or are they on different pages? Only thing that they have the same is the day. Although they say it's not important. Yeah. Then why make a big deal of it if it's not important? Exactly. Yeah. Why make a big deal if you keep the Sabbath? Exactly. <laughs> I remember many time, many years ago, a lady said to me, she said, you know, Pastor, I, I tried to call you all day Monday. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but Monday is it's my day off. It's my Sabbath. And she said, well, the devil never takes a day off. <laughs> I said, yeah, and if I didn't, I'd be just like the devil. <laughs> God rests. God rests. Are you busier than God? The Bible uh, tells us this on the screen, Exodus 31, verse 17. One day a week... God says, will always serve as a reminder that I made the heavens and the earth in six days, and then on the seventh day I rested and relaxed. Now, why did God rest and relax on the seventh day? Well, he certainly wasn't tired because God doesn't get tired. God, God never gets tired. But he was modeling for us what he wanted us to do, to rest and to relax, to keep a Sabbath, to have balance and to relax in, in the goodness of this is an important one. Limit my work to six days a week. You say, you're kidding me. I'm saying, if you're not doing that, you're breaking one of God's big 10, the 10 commandments. Rest and recreation are so important to life, God put it in the big 10, the 10 commandments, right up there with don't commit adultery, don't murder, and don't steal. He says, every six days you take a day off. If you're not taking a day off every week, you are breaking the Ten Commandments. You say, well, I'd never murder anybody. I'd never commit adultery. But are you taking a day off every week? It's right up there in the Big Ten. That's how important God considers rest and recreation and relaxation. Now, this is the Fourth Commandment. And when God gives a commandment, he's serious about it. This is not like an option like, well, if you feel like it, Take a day off. No, it's called the Sabbath. Let me show you some verses. Exodus 23, 12, here on the screen. Work the first six days of the week, 
but rest and relax on the seventh. This is the law, he says. This law is not only for you, but all for, also for your animals, so your pet needs to have a Sabbath, <laughs> as well as everyone else, including foreigners among you. God says, I don't want anybody unprotected from this law. And he said, this law of rest and recreation and having a Sabbath, having a day off every week, he said, everybody should be protected from overwork, including immigrants and foreigners who have come in. They shouldn't be overworking either. Now here's the fourth commandment. Exodus 20, verse nine and 10. This is one of the 10 commandments, the fourth commandment. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is to be a day of complete rest. Circle that, complete rest, dedicated to me. Now this is called the Sabbath. Every seventh day, you take a day off. And a Sabbath, you might write this down, Sabbath means a day of rest. That's what it means. And uh, you know, did you know that your heart actually beats different, different every seven days? We're, we're biologically wired for a day of rest. Now this whole idea of where God says, I want you to have a day of rest and worship, it's not for God's benefit. It's not just some arbitrary law. God did it so you won't burn out. And the reason people are so stressed out today is they've forgotten this. In culture after culture after culture after culture, it's for your benefit. Look at this, Mark 2, verse 27. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made to benefit man. In other words, God didn't make the Sabbath for his benefit. He made it for ours. When I ignore God's laws, who gets hurt? Not God. I get hurt when I don't follow the owner's manual. Now, when is your Sabbath? I'm telling you, it doesn't matter what day of the week you take your Sabbath. The Bible says this many times in the New Testament. What day you worship on, what day you take as your day off, as your day of rest, your day of recreation, it doesn't matter the day, you just need to do it every week. Okay, my Sabbath is not Saturday, my Sabbath is not Sunday. I'm working on those days. My Sabbath is every Monday. It's Monday. And by the way, I would encourage you to not call it your day off because if you, you call it your day off, you'll cheat on it. You need to start calling your day off your Sabbath. Now that was a most fascinating discourse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we could talk for hours on it. Yeah. But let's just mention a few salient points. He says, a Sabbath. The Bible says, the, the Sabbath. He says, any day. The Bible says, the seventh day. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your ox nor your donkey. In other words, your tractor stays in the barn. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Unless you're going to do an act of mercy, right? So it's fascinating to me that he says this law is binding. Yes absolutely binding it's part of the big 10 you have to keep it and you're breaking god's 10 commandments if you don't keep a sabbath but he consistently hey. talks about his sabbath mm -hmm. now many people have told me oh you keep your sabbath and i'll keep my sabbath mm -hmm. so i've had this argument many times and i i try to correct them i say no 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 you keep your sabbath and i'll keep god's okay. sabbath because god said the seventh day. Now, who's Lord of the Sabbath? Jesus. Jesus is Lord of mm -hmm. the Sabbath. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath day? Yes, but according to his principles. principles. Aha. Very well. So, here we have a very interesting statement. He says, it's part of the law of God. It's part of the big ten. It's obligatory. You have to keep it but you can choose any day you like. Mm. It's not biblical. It never says so in the Bible. He says it's written many times in the New, in the Testament. New Testament. We'll look at that. He's misquoting the Bible. Mm -hmm. He's totally ignoring the precept, right? Correct. So interesting. So file that. Um, Copeland also said basically any day. Yes. 
as part of the commandment. Same. And the, he also said there's no new commandment that says it has to be on the Sunday. That's correct. So, yeah. so both of them are way off when it comes to what the scripture says. Now Rick Warren said many times in the New Testament and Copeland also said they came together on the first day of the week. Yeah. So let's have a look at those texts. It's interesting that those texts are mentioned eight times. And this is a main argument that these were there to show you that we should worship on a Sunday. So the resurrection was was a major event in history. I mean, it is the event of history. And it took place on the first day of the week. Nowhere does it say we must commemorate that day by keeping it as a rest day, right? So, let's look at the text. The first one we find in Matthew 28, verse 1. And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and other Mary, the other Mary to see the sepulchre. The New English Bible says the Sabbath had passed and it was about daybreak on Sunday. So does this say that they worshipped on that day or that the day has been changed? No, not at all. So it doesn't say anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. So it's just a statement of fact. He rose on the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. Good. Let's just look at this here. It says here in Luke 23, verse 54 to 56, and that day was the preparation. That's when he was crucified. And the Sabbath drew near. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointment and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it's very clear mm -hmm. that the commandment was still in place and kept when Jesus died. Yes. So the previous verse where it mentioned the first day of the week was just telling us that they went to the grave on the first day of the week. Yes. Now here's the second verse that mentions the first day of the week, and that's Mark 16, 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, again, you know exactly, the seventh day is the Sabbath. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices. They might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. Is there anything there that they worshipped on the first day of the week? No. No. Yes. Nothing that the Sabbath was changed now to this first day. What day had they kept as a Sabbath? The Saturday. The Saturday, the seventh day, right? So there's nothing there that the Sabbath was changed? No. no. Here's the third text, Mark 16, verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Are they worshipping on this day? No. No? They Even just came together end. on the first day of the week, right? Mm. Okay. So that's three down. Here's the fourth one. Luke 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Anything there? No. Nothing. Mm -mm. Just so we're whittling down Rick Warren's verses, right? <laughs> we're on the fourth one. Okay. What about the fifth one? This is John 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre and sees the stone taken away from the sepulchre. So the first five verses just tell us that Jesus rose on the first day of the week and that the tomb was empty, right? Yes. That's it. Nothing else. The sixth verse. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews came Jesus and stood in their midst and says unto them, Peace be unto you. This is the resurrection day. Yes. So now this is where the disciples got together. So the disciples got together to come and celebrate and worship on the new day that had been implemented by nobody at all, because this is the first time Jesus appears to them. No, they were 
They because they're scared. <laughs> Aha. So on the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, in other words, before sunset on the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, mm -hmm. where the disciples were assembled, not to worship, but because they were afraid of the Jews. Yeah. They felt pretty safe on the Sabbath. They knew the Jews wouldn't do anything on the Sabbath day. But on the first day, they thought, whoops, what's going to happen now? Mm. So they got together and they were scared. And Jesus appeared in the midst of them. And did he tell them at that occasion, from now on, you will keep the first day of the week? No. No. Even Kenneth Copeland says there's no such command, right? Mm -hmm. The seventh verse. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, whoops, they've got us. Yeah, that's trouble. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, the New English Bible says Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting. So, what happened here? Let's analyze this verse. They will say they came together to break bread. Well, the Bible says they came to break bread on a daily basis. Yes. So that wasn't the Sabbath issue. Mm. They ate together. They had a meal together. Yes. So what happened here? On the first day of the week, the disciples came together for a meal yes. to break bread. And Paul preached to them until midnight. So... When does the when is the Sabbath over? This uh, at Sabbath sunset. E yeah, sunset Saturday evening. Okay, so they kept the Sabbath, mm -hmm. and then after the Sabbath, they had a church meeting. Yes, because it was evening. Oh, he continued preaching into the night. Well, they came together, and then he preached until midnight. Yeah, but that was yeah. Poor Saturday old Uticus fell asleep. Right, mm. fell out the window. Now, why was he preaching until midnight? Because, because he was going to depart on yeah. the morrow when the sun came up. What day would that be? The first day, Sunday. Uh, Paul was going to go on a long journey on the first day of the week. Wasn't he keeping the new Sabbath? Obviously not, right? So they came together on Saturday night after the Sabbath. So they'd kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Then they had a church meeting because Paul was going to leave the next morning. It wasn't Sabbath to them. Mm. It was a work day. He was on a mission. So he had a quick meeting with them before he departed. Yeah. So there's nothing there about a new work, a new worship day. And that's also not changing, the, uh, now starting a new tradition. Absolutely not. Let's re get a little bit more details. It says, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. So it was an evening meeting, mm. and it wasn't Sabbath anymore. No. It was the first day of the week. When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, he talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. What day was that when he departed? First day. He didn't stay for worship? Mm. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So there's no issue at all that there was a worship service dedicated to a new Sabbath. Yes. Nothing of the kind. And here's the last and final text. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, the Wehrmuth translation says, at his home, mm -hmm. as God has prospered him, and there be no gathering when I come. So now the people are saying, oh, they had a church service, and this is a church collection. This verse is actually very interesting. Now, in the old days, and even in many places still today, when was payday? At the end of the week. Yes. What day? The Friday. Friday. Yes. So Friday you got your pay. Mm. Now, that would be towards the end of the Friday, right? Mm. So Paul is saying, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye, 
on the first day of the week, put your money aside that you want to give to God. Your tithe, in other words. Mm. So when did they get their money? The Friday. Why was he only going to put it t together on the first day of the week? They were keeping Sabbath. Ah, uh, they were keeping the Sabbath and he didn't want them to go and count money and calculate what goes to God, what is offering, what is this. Leave that for the first day of the week. Mm. And when he comes, he'll collect it. Did he collect it on that day? No. No. They just put it aside. And when he came, he would collect it. So is this verse actually in favor of the Sabbath mm. as a rest day or the first day? Actually, yes. Okay, so there are the eight verses. That's eight verses mentioning the first day of the week. And all of them support the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christ came to fulfill the law. Did Jesus change the law? This is the heading in the King James Bible. We mm. didn't make that heading. Matthew 5 from verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Are heaven and earth still here? Yes. Well, I think so. I think so, <laughs> I think so. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Whosoever there shall, shall break one of the least commandments of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So now some people say, okay, so it's all right to teach it, you just won't be very important in heaven. <laughs> but that's not what it says, yeah. we'll see. But uh, whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then he qualifies what's least. Mm. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. A very important word, exceed. Yes. Not the same as. Now, how can your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees? The disciples were very surprised because these were such holy people. Mm. I mean, how can you be more holy than that? How can we be more holy? The only way we can be more holy than anyone else that assumes to be holy is by the imputed and imparted righteousness of Christ. In other words, you have to accept Christ. Christ. Did he come to abolish the law? No. How long will it stand? Forever. Forever. Will one jot or one tittle, that's a comma or a full stop, mm. disappear out of the law? No. So is the fourth commandment still there? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you love me, keep my commandments. He who says he loves me and keeps not my commandments is a liar and the truth is not in them. And if you teach others that you don't have to keep the law, or you can keep any day, you must be careful. Mm -hmm. Because you're like the scribes and the Pharisees who make their own laws. Mm. What did Jesus say to them? Didn't he say to them, Whoa. you transgress mm. the law of God for your traditions. Very important. So we're keeping traditions mm. in the world and not God's commandment. Yes, because there's a they're saying that even though it's not commanded, the tradition, it was the tradition of the disciples to eventually start keeping the Sunday as a reset. And now Without a seen, command of God, you can't do that. Exactly. And now, as we've seen, keeping tradition is putting you in conflict with God. Absolutely. I am the Lord. I change not. I do not alter what has gone out of my mouth. So the other verse, of course, that I always mention is Colossians 2, and they did not disappoint. They threw it in there. Verse 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Plural Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So now let no one tell you what the Sabbath day is. So Rick Warren says, his Sabbath is Mondays. Mm. You can eat what you like. You can do, well. Where in the Ten Commandments does it say, thou shalt not eat this, that, or the other? 
Nowhere. No. Does it say anywhere in the Ten Commandments what kind of meat offering or drink offering you should bring? No. Where does it say that? In what law? In the uh, ceremonial laws. Aha. So when it talks about drink offerings and meat offerings and new moon days, is it talking about ceremonial days or about Sabbath day? C uh, the ceremonial. How can you take that one, the Sabbath year, and put it separate and say that's the Ten Commandments, but the rest are ceremonial. And then, by the way, it's plural. Yeah. Unless, of course, you work with some new translations mm -hmm. which make it the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, day, which is a deliberate falsehood snuck in there by an enemy of God. Precisely. Right? So the received text clearly tells you plural, lowercase, Sabbath days, yeah. which means ceremonial Sabbaths. So the ceremonial la Sabbaths were a shadow of things to come. A shadow of what? Christ. Of Christ. So the ceremonial Sabbaths are gone, not the seventh-day Sabbath. And maybe we can also mention here that there's a distinction between the ceremonial Sabbaths and all those laws that was written by the hand of Moses in a book. And was put beside the ark. Oh. And not in, in the, the ark. ark. That was the law written with the finger of God. That twice. was in the ark. And the ceremonial the law was against us. In other words, it was against us because it pointed to us as sinners who needed redemption. But the law told us what sin was. Mm. So nowhere in the New Testament is there a change of the law. Now, you and I, we are Seventh-day Adventists. Are you a Seventh-day Adventist by choice? Yes. You made a choice? Yes. Were you coerced to become a Seventh-day Adventist? No. You know what? The very last thing that I would logically become <laughs> yes. is a Seventh-day Adventist. There must be pretty compelling reasons why you would keep the Seventh-day holy and believe that God is your creator and redeemer in this world and that you're going to show it to the world by honoring mm -hmm. his commandments, right? So there are many, many people who argue against this issue. We're talking about some big names today. We had Kenneth Copeland's view, mm -hmm. Rick Warren's view, now, uh, this man over here is uh, Kent Hovind, and I have a great respect for his, his thinking and his, his, his lectures and all of these things. So this is not an attack on him. Yeah. Like we said, this is not an attack on any of these no. people. No, not we, at all. We're showing this to move towards a point. We want to say... Where does this theology come from and how many permutations of this theology are there up there? And each and every single one of them stands in juxtaposition to the Bible. The Bible hasn't moved. No. Kenneth Copeland moved. Mm -hmm. Rick Warren moved. Let's see whether Kent Hovind has also moved. Let's just listen to what he has to say on the Sabbath day. What about the Sabbath? Well, I get asked probably every week. I get books sent to me. I've got a whole section of our library by probably every book ever written by any Seventh-day Adventist, and they're all trying to convert me over to being a Seventh-day Adventist. And they send me all kinds of stuff, and don't send me any more. I've already got them all, okay? I don't need any more. I've got lots of books, all the books by Ellen G. White, E.G. White, okay, who wrote, and she was the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not anti-Seventh-day Adventist. I've spoken at some of their churches. And there's a lot of good folks, love the Lord, genuinely saved, going to heaven as much as I am. But what is the truth about the Sabbath? Are we supposed to, you know, work on the seventh, rest on the seventh day? Is that the day of worship or the day of rest? Or what is the truth about the Sabbath? Well, Nehemiah chapter 9, uh, it says, Thou camest down upon Mount Sinai, and spakest uh, with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments, true laws, good statutes, and madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Wait a minute, this is Nehemiah talking about the time Moses received the Sabbath from God. That's 2,500 years after the creation. See, I don't have Moses even on that chart, but 
2,500 years after the creation, God made the Sabbath known to Moses. You mean for 2,500 years, for more than a third of human history, nobody kept this? Apparently so. He revealed it to Moses. He said in Exodus 16, See that the Lord hath given you the seventh day, every man abide in his place. Don't go out of your house on the Sabbath day. Well, if that's really one of the laws for the Sabbath, then you can't have a seventh day church that meets someplace because everybody's going out of their house to get there. All right? You talk about a Sabbath day's journey in Acts chapter 1. Jesus traveled on the Sabbath, okay? What's he doing out of his house? The Bible says, Remember the Sabbath, and it thou shalt not do any work. Don't you do it, nor your son, nor your maidservant, nor the stranger. Not only can you not work, you can't make anybody else work. Which means if you really want to honor and obey the Sabbath according to Scripture, you cannot work and you can't make anybody else work, which means you cannot use any utilities. Because if you're using the city water, the city lights, the city gas, you're making somebody work. If you're watching TV, you're making somebody work on the Sabbath. If you go out to eat, you're making somebody work. You can't do that. So, he rested the seventh day. The Bible says if they worked on the seventh day, Exodus 31, they'd be put to death. So you've got to kill people that work on the Sabbath. It's punishable by death. Exodus 31 is a key passage on this. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, My Sabbaths ye shall keep. It is a sign between me and you. The children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. I mean, it's right there, Exodus 31. It's pretty clear. The Sabbath was for the children of Israel. I'm Norwegian. Sabbath, God made some strange rules for the children of Israel because they were to be a peculiar people. People were to look at them and say, wow, that's strange. What's different about you guys? And they were to be a testimony to the world. But he didn't command all the world to keep this. He said, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. It's pretty clear in Exodus 31. Exodus 35 says, You shall need, kindle no fire, which means you couldn't start your car. Don't they run on internal combustion? You know, you're starting a fire. So if you really want to keep the Sabbath, you can enjoy yourself. I've never met anybody, anybody who keeps the Sabbath. Never met one person. Okay? The elders of Israel, he said in Ezekiel 28, he says, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them. The Sabbath is for the children of Israel. Again, it tells us in Ezekiel chapter 20. Jesus was on the Sabbath day going through the corn. He plucked the corn because they were hungry and they ate it. First of all, what's he doing out of his house? And what's he doing working on the Sabbath day? Did he not keep it? The Bible says in Mark chapter 2, uh, the Pharisees said, Why do you do that which on the Sabbath which is not lawful? And he said, The Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. What's he doing out of his house and what's he doing working on the Sabbath? Jesus said in Mark 3, It's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day to save life. And they looked about, they got angry at him for his answer. And people today get angry at me because I don't keep what their idea of the Sabbath is. I say, look, I, I keep every day as holy. I work seven days a week for the Lord. My whole life is soaked up into God's work. I do nothing else. <laughs> this is it. So people say, do you, you keep the Sabbath? Oh, yeah. And, and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I keep them all. Yeah, I keep them all. Okay. <laughs> do them all. Jesus went outside on the Sabbath. He took his disciples with him. What's he doing? Picking them, Sam. He picked corn. He healed people. He got angry at the hypocrites. He's not resting and being refreshed, that's for sure. If he's getting angry at the hypocrites on the Sabbath. I think that was the most interesting one of all, right? Yeah. And uh, probably the most confused. There's I think a, there's a lot of people with the same sentiment. Same view. Now, I think I'll stick to his creation evolution lectures because when it comes to this theology there's quite a bit of confusion. Number one, the law was only given to Moses. Mm. Nobody before that kept, kept the law. Mm. But uh, even in the time of Moses, before he got the law, they kept the law. Mm. Right? We've, there's scripture that supports it. And he has many arguments as to why is not a Seventh-day Adventist and what the law was regarding the Sabbath day and that it was only given to the children of Israel. Now, uh, Jesus came to correct the false perceptions on the Sabbath. The reasons why they weren't to go out and collect firewood to make fire on the Sabbath, because the Bible says, preparation day, get your cooking and things done. There's nothing wrong with warming up your food or this or that or the other, but to go collecting wood, etc., etc. God was drilling into them a Sabbath of rest in him. And it was a theocracy. 
So when it came to sentences of death, etc., etc., that was under a theocratic system and prefigured an eternal death. If you don't want to find rest in him, you will have eternal death. That's it. The, the, if you're not satisfied about how God treated the punishment then, yes. you won't be satisfied about of how he's going to treat it in the end. Exactly. So under the, theocratic laws, there were certain judicial laws as well. When Israel chose a king, then the theocratic laws fell away, but not the Ten Commandments. No. They were forever. So let us just look at some of the laws and things that he spoke about and see if he is spot on or not. So the law was only given to Moses. Before that, nobody kept the Sabbath. Uh, he completely forgets Genesis chapter 2, which should be his forte as a creationist. In Genesis chapter 26, it tells us, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Yeah. I wonder what laws Abraham kept, because that was long before there was a Jew, mm -hmm. long before there was a Moses. Moses. So what commandments did he keep? And if he did keep them, why did he not write them down? By the way, how old were the antediluvians? How old were the early post-diluvians? How old were people in the time of Abraham? Mm -hmm. Well, they were over 900 years old in the beginning. Yes. They were 400 years and older after the flood. And by the time you get to Abraham, he was over 180 18. years old, right? So these people were brilliant. Mm -hmm. Their minds were absolutely, in, a, in contrast to ours, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And most of them were living in a time where his great-great-grandfather was still probably alive. Yes. So everything was verbally still. Everything was word of mouth. Mm -hmm. In fact, the very descendants of Noah were still alive in the time of Abraham. Amen. Abraham still communicated with them and spoke to them. So now, they didn't have to write things down. So only when the mind started to become forgetful were these things codified and language came into existence. So Abraham kept the commandments, the statutes and the laws, so they must have existed before Moses. So there's no way that Kent Hovind can be right on that score. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 says, For what says the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham kept the commandments and he believed God. So the descendants of Abraham mm -hmm. must keep the commandments yes. and believe God, right? Yep. Did God say, Remember the seventh Sabbath day, keep it holy? Yes. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Mm -hmm. So you must believe and you must keep. And the scripture was fulfilled, says James 2 verse 23, which says Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. So now people say, all right, so all it takes is to believe there's no commandment. But they forget the verse, Genesis 26, verse 5. Here are they that keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus. Nothing has changed. No. Nothing. Nothing. Now here's a very interesting portion of Scripture. This is now before the children of Israel left Egypt. And you have this confrontation with Pharaoh. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do you, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get ye unto your burdens? Mm. So obviously Moses and Aaron were telling the people, Don't work. Yes. Now what irritated Pharaoh? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and ye, Moses, in other words, you make them rest. 
When you look it up, the word is Shabbat. You, Moses, make the people keep the Sabbath. Before they left Egypt, mm -hmm. they'd obviously forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the commandment say remember? Yes. They'd forgotten. So here comes Moses and Aaron, and they tell them, uh -uh, you won't work on the Sabbath. And Pharaoh lost it, right? Yes. And he says, why do you make them rest from them? Get you to your burdens. Yeah. I will double your double workload. So that they can't finish it by the Friday. They have to carry on. And so what law did Pharaoh make there? Wasn't it an anti-Sabbath law? Correct. Uh -huh. So if you read your Bible carefully, then you can see that none of these great preachers are sticking to the biblical script. They're making their own script. Yes. Tradition and, it, and um, commandments of men. Yes. Not a thus says the Lord. Mm. Thus I think. Mm. And here's a wonderful book that I can give you. It's full of logic. Mm. But it's not full of the right scripture. Why don't you bring the Bible and say, okay, let's study and see here. Yeah. Because I have like a wonderful book. It's called? The Bible. Ah. And like you've just shown, uh, Nehemiah, which he quoted, and the Exodus is quoted out of context. Absolutely it's out of context. And here's the word that is there. You can look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Shabbat is rest. Keep the Sabbath. That's what it said. So what was God's answer to Pharaoh's anti-Sabbath law? The plagues. Plagues. Blood, frogs, lice, flies, cattle, boils, hail, locusts, darkness and the death of the firstborn. Now, we've written some of them in blue here. Is there a particular reason? Yes, I'm sure, because it's going to have something to do with the seven last ones. Aha! Uh -huh. There are four plagues here which are repeated at the end of time. Four is the number of the earth. North, east, south, west. So, what happened here in a local application is going to happen in a worldwide universal application. When an anti-Sabbath law was made in the time of the Exodus, which prefigured the children of God or the children of Israel, spiritual Israel, going to Canaan, there will be a repetition of four of those plagues in the last seven plagues. And it's seven plagues because that's the number of completeness. That's God's number. The number of God, God's wrath will be complete. And Psalms 105, verse 43 to 45 tell us, And he brought forth his people with joy and his chosen with gladness. Now they're going out of Egypt. Yeah. And gave them the lands of the heathen, and they inherited the labor of the people. So typically, God's people are going to inherit the earth. Why? That they might observe his statutes and keep its laws. So is it going to be in, the, in heaven? Exactly the same. You won't be in heaven. You won't be able to go to heaven if you refuse to keep God's commandments. And what a beautiful test, the Sabbath day. Yes. Remember the Sabbath day. A lot of people say it's impossible to keep the Ten Commandments. But even Paul said, the commandments is not a heavy... They're not burdensome, no. no. They're not burdensome. So you're going to have to keep the commandments because the Bible says that you will enter into heaven if you keep the commandments. And Jesus said it to, to many. And he said, how readest thou? Yeah. What must I do to inherit and to love? How readest thou? Keep the commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Absolutely. Exodus 16, 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. And the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day, and this day I will test them, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. The Sabbath became a particular test because the manna, only fell on a particular day. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it shall be none. Not the Monday, the Tuesday, not your Sabbath, there will be none. Yeah. His Sabbath, there will be none. It's so clear. 
Exodus 16, 29, see, for that the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Now that's what he was talking about, right? Does that mean that you are locked down? Now the Jews made a law and said you're allowed to walk a thousand meters on a, on a Sabbath day. But that was a Jewish law. What he is saying is don't go and explore the world. We're going to worship on this day together. Worship God. Don't make big plans for moving around. It doesn't say you're locked in your room under lockdown. It's not a lockdown rule. So they're distorting the scriptures. Now, the most fascinating one is the one where MacArthur explains why the Sabbath is no longer binding. And I think it's very important that we talk about what he has to say, because he's playing a very prominent role in the days that we are living in. Mm -hmm. And we know from Scripture that the Sabbath is going to be an important issue. Yes. Now, I'm not saying these people are deliberately vindictive, but as we've seen, there are so many different views on the issue. But they all seem to be quite happy to come together on the Sunday, right? Mm. So let's have a look what MacArthur has to say on the issue. How are we to understand the place that the Sabbath plays, if any, in the life of the people of God? In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. There is no question about the other nine commandments being permanent and binding. Those are all moral mandates, moral commands, with the exception of verses 8 through 11, the fourth command regarding the Sabbath. And the question that is often posed is a simple one, if all the other commands are permanent, is not this one permanent as well? There are people who believe it is, and we might call them strict Sabbatarians. They fall generally into two categories. One would be Seventh-day Adventists. I think we're familiar with them. I think it's legitimate to consider Seventh-day Adventism as a cult because they believe that the writings of Ellen G. White are inspired by God and can be put alongside the Bible. But they identify themselves as faithful to the fourth command. There are also Seventh-day Baptists, a smaller group that interpret the commandment as permanently binding as well. Not quite so strict, you could uh, also identify what you would call Christian Sabbatarians. They have decided that as Christians we must keep the Sabbath, but it's not any longer the seventh day, it's the first day. So they shift the command in Exodus from Saturday to Sunday, every, um, every Saturday. America, the Western world with its Christian influences, worked toward a five-day work week. Part of that was the underlying sense that Saturday was a day to enjoy the creation. Saturday is a perpetual witness to God as Creator. Sunday, on the other hand, is a perpetual witness to God as Redeemer. Jesus would never violate the Ten Commandments. Jesus would never violate the law of God. He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. But Jesus did anything He wanted on the Sabbath. 
and incited the leaders in the doing of it because it was part of bringing down that whole system. In verse 17, he goes even beyond that and defends what he did by saying this, "'My Father is working until now, and I myself am working.'" Wow. This is a claim to be deity. My Father and I are doing our work before Your eyes. We are working. For this reason, therefore, verse 18, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Him because He not only was breaking the Sabbath but also was calling God His own Father, making Himself equal with God. He was calling Himself, He was calling, I should say, God His Father and continually involved in activities that violated Sabbath law. Pharisees charged Jesus with breaking the Sabbath law, making Himself equal with God, and this led them to kill Him eventually. Jesus never attempted to fit His activities into the Sabbath law of the Old Covenant. He established His own authority as one with God and as Lord over the Sabbath. That was phenomenal. No, indeed, it was astounding. Now, I have great respect for many things that this man has to say. Now, he calls Seventh-day Adventists a cult. Definition of a cult is someone who has an extraneous source to the Bible, right? So the biggest cult on earth must be the Roman Catholic Church because they have tradition and the Bible, and the Bible has to be analyzed and evaluated in the light of tradition, tradition yes. not the other way around. Subservant. So that's the biggest cult. The problem is, of course, that their tradition is at variance with the Bible. It says exactly the opposite in most cases. Mm -hmm. So there you have two sources contradicting each other which determine the doctrine and therefore the Bible is set aside. Now Seventh-day Adventists have the writings of Ellen G. White, mm -hmm. but they are in absolute harmony with the Bible. Correct. In fact, they are nothing but Bible quotes and placing them into context. Correct, yeah. So if somebody writes a book which quotes Bible verses and expounds on them, is that a cult? Isn't that what the Christian world does? So we could argue on that issue. Mm -hmm. Then his fascinating statement that Jesus broke the Sabbath. He says Jesus never broke any law. Mm. He was absolutely obedient, but he broke the Sabbath law. Yeah. So Jesus was intent on bringing down the Sabbath. Did he? No. Nope. So let's try and answer that question. Did Jesus keep the Sabbath? Well, let's go to the one verse which says that he did it according to his custom. Luke chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. It was his custom to keep the Sabbath day. Mm. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And then he quotes this famous text and says, Today the scripture is fulfilled. And now they've also got some people that say, Yes, he did keep the Sabbath, but it was because he was a Jew and he had to keep this, the laws of the Jews. We just now read. Jesus' own verse, do not think that I've come to abolish the law. Exactly. Not one jot or one tittle will by any means disappear from the law. Is the Sabbath commandment written by the finger of God on tables of stone? Yes. Now MacArthur said that the others are logical laws because they are definite injunctions that you shall not steal, you shall not do. But the Sabbath doesn't say that. It says, remember. Mm. Therefore, he discards it. With what right? He tries, By whose authority? Yeah. He's trying to say that Jesus 
did it himself. Jesus did it himself. All right. He even knocks the Sunday. Yeah. But he keeps the Sunday. His church services are on a Sunday. Well, MacArthur is in court these days because of violating the laws on the COVID-19 for not get uh, churches are not allowed to get together indoors on a Sunday. Uh-huh. So in actual words, what you're saying is he is fighting for Sunday worship while he himself says it's not important. Now, some people might say, yeah, but that's only because they're worshiping on Sunday. He is actually just fighting for worshiping. But it's confusing, it's confusing. right? confusing. But let's look what Jesus did. As his custom was, he went and kept the Sabbath. Now, people say the Sabbath is not that prominent in the New Testament. The Sabbath is incredibly prominent in the New Testament. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, to put it in right in settings. Right he said to the Jews, why do you violate God's commandment for your traditions? Mm. Why do you have so many exactions and rules and regulations which are not part of the law of God? And there were 2,000 laws on how to keep the Sabbath. Mm. And the Bible has a handful. Yes. If I had to go and study the Bible on exactly how to keep the Sabbath and I study it, then I will find that God says, do not neglect the assembly of the saints. Mm -hmm. And God says, call the Sabbath a delight, not doing your own thing. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it honorable, and then you run out of injunctions, right? So Jesus came to put the record straight. Yeah. Now, his miracles, his acts of benevolence, his acts of mercy, his acts of kindness, they were emphatically enacted on the, the Sabbath. Sabbath day. And he would point out the hypocrisy of the Jews. Yes. Shall not this woman think of it? This many years burdened with this disease be set free on the Sabbath day. Which one of you having an ox, etc., mm. etc., et will not lead him to water if he's fallen into a pit, will not take him out on the Sabbath day? Where are your thoughts? Did he break the Sabbath day or did he elevate the he Sabbath elevated day? elevated it according to his dictates. So how can not these the people even dare to say that Jesus broke the Sabbath day. They said you weren't allowed to Become. eat or prepare food. Mm. They were walking through the field. By the way, today, if I go walking through someone's field, st stealing his corn and eating it, I would be breaking the law, right? Mm. I could, would be trespassing. It was a law of God that if you were traveling, and you were going through someone else's field, you were allowed to satisfy your immediate need, but you weren't allowed to harvest and take away for others or to sell. Mm -hmm. That was theft. So he was not breaking any law. And their laws of ritual washings weren't in the Bible. Mm -hmm. They had concocted them because they wanted to seem to be so rigid. Yeah. So the Sabbath is about love to God, about service to your neighbor, yes. and Jesus came to live out the essence of the law. And to say that he broke it is almost a blasphemy. Almost a blasphemy, if it isn't mm. one. Because he was without sin, and sin is transgression, transgression of, of the law. I just want to ask... Um, Kent Hovind mentioned that he has never met anybody that keeps the Sabbath because of when you use electricity or water or any of these. In God's original setup for the Sabbath, this wouldn't have been a violation. It wouldn't have been the same that we have today. No. It today we are not under a theocratic law, number one. And the law applies to those in whose heart the law is written. So you and your household 
you will say, I will do no unnecessary work. But if I can alleviate uh, a burden or help someone, not by cutting his lawn or fixing his motor vehicle because I can do that on any other day, but if that person is suffering, I can go and alleviate that suffering. Jesus did that on a Sabbath day. Exactly. And he is my example. So the Sabbath to me is about worship, it is about fellowship, it's about being in communi communion with God, and with his word, with his nature, and all of those things. Um, even Jesus, when he was on earth, he, meant he went to fellowship on a Sabbath. He went to Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Correct. And what's interesting is he attended the the synagogue on the Sabbath day and thereafter went to Peter's house on one occasion and Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he healed her on the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And what did she do? She got up and ministered to them, yes. provided a meal for them. So that was all lawful on the Sabbath day. Our denominational name, here's a, a quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. I was shown in regard to the remnant people of God taking a name. Because these people all seem to have it in for the Seventh-day Adventists. Kent Oven spoke about them, MacArthur spoke about them. They have a problem with Seventh-day Adventists. Exactly. So it's not that Seventh-day Adventists are unnoticed. No, no, they are noticed. They are noticed. And they are irritating mm -hmm. to many people. So I was shown in regard to the remnant people of God taking a name. Two classes were presented before me. One class embraced the great bodies of professed Christians. They were trampling upon God's law and bowing down to a papal institution. They say they don't keep it, but they keep it. Mm. They were keeping the first day of the week as a Sabbath of the Lord. The other class, who were but few in number, were bowing to the great lawgiver. They were keeping the fourth commandment. The peculiar and prominent features of their faith were the observance of the seventh day and waiting for the appearing of our Lord from heaven. That's the great hope of the Christian, right? No name which we can take will be appropriate but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. He spoke about a peculiar people. Mm -hmm. And he said that only the Jews were peculiar people. And that's why they had peculiar laws. That's why they had peculiar laws. But Peter, addressing the Christian church, says, you are a peculiar people, a holy priesthood, a special treasure. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. That's why they have to call it a cult, a sect. Well, so was... Paul called a sect. Yes, and he said, by what you call a sect, I am happy to be part of it. Exactly. Here is the line of distinction between the worshippers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. It's interesting how they, they tread water this way, that way, but they ignore the direct teaching of the word of God. The great conflict is between the commandments of God and the requirements of the beast. Even amongst God's people, that was Jesus' great conflict mm. in how to obey God. Yes. It is because the saints are keeping all ten of the commandments that the dragon makes war upon them. If they will lower the standard and yield the peculiarities of their faith, the dragon will be at peace. But they excite his ire because they have dared to raise the standard and unfurl their banner in opposition to the Protestant world who are worshipping the institution of the papacy. And they all have their own reasons. Yes, there's different reasons for why they're keeping the Sunday. And they are pointing out the Seventh-day Adventists as the culprit. As the problem. The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will convict the inquiring mind. 
Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressors of God's law and will lead to repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do these people think that people like you and I one day decided, oh, oh I would like to be part of a cult. Mm. Maybe I can join a sect that does something weird like keep the Sabbath and destroy my career and destroy my friendships right. and destroy everything that, that makes life exciting on this be planet. Be continually um, hammered. Given, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do, do they think that? Or is there a compelling reason why we have become Seventh-day Adventists? I was shown that almost every fanatic who has arisen, who wishes to hide his sentiments, that he may lead away others, claims to belong to the Church of God. Such a name would at once excite suspicion, for it is employed to conceal the most absurd errors. This name is too indefinite for the remnant people of God. It would lead to the supposition that we had a faith which we wish to cover up. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Are we ashamed of our name? We answer no. No, we are not. It is the name the Lord has given us. It points out the truth that is to be the test of the churches. We are Seventh-day Adventists, and of this name we are never to be ashamed. As a people, we must take a firm stand for truth and righteousness. Thus we shall glorify God. We are to be delivered from the dangers, not ensnared and corrupted by them. That this may be, we must look ever to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And he kept the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath holy. He was merciful, kind and showed the power of his deity on the Sabbath day. He is Lord of the Sabbath. I'll follow his example. And even the example of his disciples. Correct. Which kept the Sabbath fall right through. He didn't change in the end. Now all of these Protestant denominations know full well that the Bible says Saturday is the Sabbath. Mm. They all know it. Yes. And yet they violate it. And they say, don't come with cultish ideas to me. I will decide when the Sabbath is. But it's not for us to decide. It's already been decided mm. by God. Yes. Now let's listen to what the ultimate usurper of God's word has to say on this issue. Let's listen to Pope Francis. He obviously knows that the Jews are keeping the right day. Now, was he propagating for keeping the Sabbath? We will have to check that out, right? See. It's obvious that they changed the day because the papacy claims that the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. What an arrogant statement. Which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from the Saturday to the Sunday. That's the converts catechism of Catholic doctrine. So they're telling you they changed it. So the Christian world is keeping a child of the papacy. And here is Laudato Si, the famous encyclical, which I understand will be augmented mm -hmm. as the Pope speaks at the United Nations. Yes. We must talk about that next time. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves and with others and with the world. 
The law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may have rest. Now why is he keeping the first day? Here's another statement from the book Maranatha. Just want to say, so what we've seen now is how the Protestant denominations see Sunday. And we've seen clearly how the papacy, the papacy sees this. Sees Absolutely. And it's in harmony. Absolutely. So what do they have got in common? They have in common a day which is not sanctified by the word of God and they have in common that they are in opposition to the word of God. Mm -hmm. The papacy is the only one that is absolutely clear. The Bible says so. We changed it. Yes. We are above the Bible. We can change even the precepts of Christ. We are God on earth. Yeah. They, they blunt on it. They're blunt. Now, and the others? They've Actually, they're saying the same. You know what? If you say that because of the tradition that it's been changed and all of these other excuses is actually in harmony with what the papacy says. Yes, because they don't have it, thus says the word. They mm. must have a thousand excuses. Mm. In fact, they are inventing excuses to excuse the papacy. Yes. They're inventing them to excuse the beast. When the Protestants, the early Protestants, paid with their lives to expose it. There is no Protestantism anymore. The only consistent Protestants are the Seventh-day Adventists. Not because I'm one. No, it's not because we're boasting or it's uh, being smart. It's because that is the only one that is keeping to the commandments of God. Correct. I was raised Catholic. My mother was Protestant. The most logical thing for me is to choose one of those two. I'm neither. I'm neither. Why? Because the Bible convinced me that there is only one choice. If you want to be in harmony with the Bible, in fact, you know what? The Roman Catholic Church has categorically stated that if you want to believe the Bible, you should be a Seventh-day Adventist. They said it. Yes, um, we actually didn't put it up, but that's important because the Roman Catholic Church and all these ones that we've seen now acknowledges Seventh-day Adventists. Does that make me great? Does that no. make you great? No, no, we are sinners saved by grace, just like Kent Oven said. Yes. But we've made a choice. Keep, uh, keep the commandments of God and show the world that you believe God. Keep the seventh day. Can you be an evolutionist and remember the Sabbath day? That God made the world in six days? No. no. I was an evolutionist. Do you think it was easy for me to change from an evolutionist to becoming a creationist? Definitely not. No. My colleagues loved it or roared with laughter? Roared. Roared. Of One course. of my colleagues said the man was struck by lightning. They even spit in your face. They even spat on my face, yes. So this is a choice. This is a choice that you have to make. doesn't make me great. No. It just makes the Bible great. And Jesus confronted hypocrisy. And so the Seventh-day Adventist, the true Seventh-day Adventist, don't think that every Seventh-day Adventist is the bee's knees mm -hmm. in this world. We all fall short of the glory of God. We're no better than anyone else in this world. But we have recognized that the Word of God is authoritative, even to the point of telling us where we have to be obedient. I just want to also say, and with all this that we've now seen on these denominations and the religion part, we've dealt with the political part where um, they all want to bring this uh, God back into the pol politics, so church and state. And which day are they promoting? Sunday. The whole time. All the time. Evil and evil says the Lord, the Eternal. It is coming. The hour has come. The hour is striking and is striking at you. The hour and the end. This is a quote from Ezekiel 7, 5 and 6. Fearful is the issue to which the world is to be brought. The powers of earth uniting to war against the commandments of God. As you said, the secular world, the religious world, 
The earth lovers, mm -hmm. the Gaia people, they're all on the bandwagon. They will decree that all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, shall conform to the customs of the church by observance of the false Sabbath. All who refuse compliance will be visited with civil penalties and will finally be declared that they are deserving of death. You can see the animosity. Mm -hmm. Don't send me anything more. I don't want to hear from you, Seventh-day Adventists. You are a cult. Whatever words they want to say. Then Jesus was a part of a cult. Mm -hmm. Then the disciples were part of the cult. Did the disciples keep the Sabbath? Yes. Did they keep the Ten Commandments? Mm -hmm. Did they ever teach that the law was abrogated, that it was gone? No. No. So what are they? They must, must they be must a cult. Been, and uh, if they were alive today, seventh they would be Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. They wouldn't have a choice, right? On the other hand, the law of God in joining the Creator's rest day demands obedience and threatens wrath against all who transgress its precepts. With the issue thus clearly brought before him, whosoever shall trample upon God's law to obey a human enactment receives the mark of the beast. And the beast has clearly said it. Yes. He accepts the sign of allegiance to the power which he chooses to obey instead of God. And that's why the Bible in Revelation 12, 17 says, The dragon was wroth with the woman, the church, and went make, make war against the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, which includes the Sabbath, and have the testimony of Jesus. Our people have been regarded as too insignificant to be worthy of notice, but a change will come. Mm -hmm. The Christian world is now making movements which will necessarily bring commandment-keeping people into prominence. The whole world is to be stirred with enmity against Seventh-day Adventists, because they will not yield homage to the papacy. By honoring Sunday, the institution of this anti-Christian power, it is the purpose of Satan to cause them to be blotted from the earth in order that his supremacy of the world may not be disputed. We don't have to read no. the rest. That is enough. Now, Are we seeing this? Absolutely. The animosity is increasing because the line of demarcation mm -hmm. is clearly drawn in the sand. This is the line. This is the choice. Now, brothers out there and sisters, why would you want to make a choice that is not based on the Word of God? Why would you want to even consider it? Why take that risk? Matthew 10 verse 22 says, You will be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. There is no necessity for thinking that we cannot endure persecution. We shall have to go through terrible times. The persecution of Protestants by Romanism, by which the religion of Jesus Christ was almost annihilated, will be more than rivaled when Protestantism and Popery are combined. Mm. Can you see it happening in the world? Yes. There will be a union of opposing elements against them. For however diverse from each other, different organizations may be in their sentiments and religious faith. Their forces are united in trampling underfoot the fourth commandment and the law of God. Those who will not themselves accept the truth are most zealous that others shall not receive it. Do we see that? We see it. Very prominent. And no matter how diverse their thinking on the issue, they are all on the same page when it comes to this. You mentioned the United Nations. And we will see, because we showed in, the pre in previous episodes, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations. What is everybody, br what is bringing them together? The same thing. The Sunday. The Sunday. So there will be persecution. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 Those who live during the last days of this earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God. 
because they know that the arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. They will say, we have a law, and by our law he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law with them is supreme. Did Rick Warren says he has a Sabbath? Mm -hmm. Did the other one say it doesn't matter which day it is? Did God specify a day? Yes. I just want to say this whole discussion has brought forth the Sabbath. And the reason being, this is going to play a very prominent role in the end. Absolutely. And we have shown quite extensively how it is a prominent role. And from here on, now we can also start in the next episodes discussing the United Nations, but also the persecution, the seven last plagues, and then there's also the final restoration. I can't wait for that. Amen. Those who respect this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow down to the idle Sabbath will have no favor shown them. If this is false prophecy, then history hasn't taken place and we are not in existence. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because these things are happening right yes. before our eyes. We can see it every single day. May God give everybody out there wisdom. It's not rocket science. Keep the commandments of God so that you may have access to the tree of life. It's as simple as that. Jesus never came to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And don't use false arguments to make him a lawbreaker while stating that he never broke the law out of the same breath in the same sentence. May God give us wisdom to keep the commandments of God, hold to the testimony, and we will see each other on the sea of glass. May God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the issue has so clearly been brought before us. The choice is such a simple one. Who has authority in our lives? May people make a choice, Lord, that the only source of authority in the entire universe that has eternal consequences is the choice for thus says the Lord. Give us the strength to follow a thus says the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.